can start recording and then I'll just wait a little bit to see who to make sure people pop in. Thank you. And if you could please announce recording once when you go yep. out to order, please. Thank Thanks you. for the reminder. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi Shawati. <laughs> it looks like our participant number has stabilized. So um, seeing a presence of a quorum, I am going to call this special meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Town Council to order at 10.01 a.m. Um, this meeting is being recorded and pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapters 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time. At this time, I'm going to take roll call attendance of the committee members and also make sure that our three interviewees um, can hear us and be heard. Um, so I'm just going to go through names, starting with Shalini. Present. Uh, Pat. Present. Mandy is present. Uh, Pam. Present. Jennifer. Present. And we welcome Jordan Helzer. Present. And Vincent O'Connor. Present. And David Slaviter. Present. Thank you all. Um, with that, we're going to jump right into our interview of the three applicants that we have to the Zoning Board of Appeals Associate Membership. Uh, the way this is going to work is that we have had we have sent questions to you. There's a list of predetermined questions. They have all been sent to the applicants. We will ask them. Each committee member will take a turn in asking those questions, and then the response order will change each time so that you're not always going first, second, or third, and you're not always following the same person. With three people, you'll follow the same person about half the time, but um, you know, we will rotate that um, so that the order is slightly different each time. Um, according to the town council uh, rules that govern this, the policy that governs this, and the um, waivers that the town council has voted and allowed the CRC to do, we will have opportunities for follow-up questions to each individual interviewee. Um, I will take those, I will offer that opportunity up to committee members after the fourth question and after the last question, so at two different times, and those questions may be different for each individual interviewee. Um, so uh, I just wanted to let you all know that. Um, so that will happen after the fourth question and then at the end, um, if there are any potential follow-up questions. Um, are there any, oh, and you will have each have up to three minutes to respond to the questions. And I will be running the timer once I get my timer up. Um, and so I will, after that three minutes are up, um, kindly ask you to, you know, wrap up your answer, um, your response to that. Are there any questions before we get started? I am not seeing anyone with any questions. Um, so we will jump right into it. Um, and I'm the one with the first question, which is the order of response will be Jordan uh, Helzer, then Vincent O'Connor, and then David Slaviter. Um, is it Slaviter or Sloviter, David? Oh, you're, you're muted, so I can't hear. <laughs> it's Sloviter, but I also answer to David happily. Okay. So Sloviter, I will pronounce that correctly okay. the rest of the, the time. Or, or David, either. <laughs> um, and so the question is, and this is for all three candidates, what do you feel you bring to the ZBA that can make it successful? Please include any experience you have appearing before the planning board or ZBA or watching their meetings. Um, and we're going to start with Jordan. So the... Basic things that I think I could bring to the ZBA are um, I've lived in Amherst since I was two, and while I don't have experience appearing before the town or meetings, I've seen this town from a wide, wide variety of perspectives, from the child of somebody who owns a place in town to a renter and a student. So I think and I've also interacted, I believe, with a fairly large swath 
of the Amherst community. So I think that I bring basically just the more spread out um, knowledge of various places and um, just I've lived in this town my whole life. I muted myself. Um, thank you, Jordan. Next is Vincent O'Connor. So, Vincent? Um. Yeah, I, I came here as a UMass student in uh, 1974. Um, I stayed, I participated in, began participating in town meeting, actually in the 1976 elections, which helped defeat the Northeast Bypass. And have, have lived here for a long time. Most recently, um, I've helped uh, four students, a boy and a girl from two separate households, single parents, uh, go through the middle school, high school, and to some extent college. Um, and I'm now driving a four and a half year old to the Crocker Farm Preschool. I, I have, you have my application, so you, you see that I've, um, I've participated in a fair number of town committees. I have appeared before the zoning board um, as an applicant, uh, appealing the decision of the building commissioner three times. Um, I've appeared on a number of occasions as a um, member of the audience, as a neighbor and a butter. Uh, in support um, in primarily of uh, applications. And regarding the planning board, my application says that I've, uh, I've attended about 10 to 12 years worth of planning board meetings, uh, not as a member, but as a town meeting petitioner and a, essentially an interested citizen in the activities of the planning board. That was mostly in the middle to uh, 70s, all the way through the 80s and 90s. And then as a petitioner, of course, um, regularly since then. So I'm familiar with the operation of the Zoning Board of Appeals, of the Planning Board, of the processes that are involved, and also the kind of um, posture that I think would be most helpful both to the public and uh, to petitioners and, and to the staff uh, the, that members could bring. And I think I could bring that kind of um, um, understanding and uh, collegiality to the process. Thank you. Um, David. I have more than 40 years of experience operating a small manufacturing and importing business, which involves constantly solving problems and challenges and being informed about every aspect of operations. I've also been involved in property development and renovations, which has included zoning issues and presentations before zoning boards. Uh, I have attended ZBA meetings and I am familiar with the way the hearings are conducted and how decisions are made. Thank you, David. Um, next is Shalini. Do you have the yes. question in front of you? I do. So we will be starting with Vincent and then David and then Jordan. And the question is, tell us about an experience you've had collaborating with a group, particularly where opinions conflicted or the decision was controversial. Did everyone get that? Okay. Okay. Um, been I have actually chosen a town meeting um, uh, article uh, process <clears throat> that um, that I got involved in late in the process. I was invited in by a group of uh, Nigerian immigrants and local citizens 
Nigerian exiles and immigrants and local citizens who proposed to the town meeting that we should stop purchasing oil from Nigeria. And so I was called in at the last minute. There was a, the, the committee that presented the article which asked for a bylaw was sort of divided. Um, both the planning, the, both the uh, finance committee and the select board were absolutely unalterably opposed to a bylaw. They wanted just a feel good resolution. Um, they were led by a gentleman who, um, who called upon his uh, ethnic group to support him. And, I, and the committee felt like they couldn't figure out um, whether a bylaw was going to be successful or not. Um, the day of the meeting, I was able to provide to the committee an understanding of what is like, was likely to happen because I called members of this gentleman's, the select board members, ethnic group, religious group, and just check with them and say, ask them, how do you feel about this article? And I was able to convince them based on the responses that I received, which was universal support, that there was not going to be a problem with the article. Um, and the article in, was presented on behalf of the committee by the daughter of the imprisoned president elect of Nigeria, whose mother had been assassinated on her way to the Canadian embassy. She had graduated from Radcliffe, written at least one or two books, and was the person designated by her parents as responsible for all of the children in the family because her father had um, uh, multiple wives and she was the daughter of the first wife. So she made the presentation eight minutes to the town meeting and 30 seconds into her presentation, I knew what was going to happen. The end result was that, and, and my part in this was to try to bring factual information to the committee rather than argue ideology about the select board and finance committee or we should go for the biggest thing or whatever. What I was able to do was provide the committee with factual information that helped them decide which course to take. The, the, the outcome, as I had predicted both at the meeting where I was the deciding vote to go forward with a bylaw and at town meeting was that the vote was 150 something to I think 15 or 16. The only people who voted against the article were the members of the select board finance committee and their spouses who were town meeting members. The other result was up. that yeah, the other result was we saved tens of thousands of dollars by doing what the bylaw required because it turned out that um, doing what we did was actually saved us money. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, just a clarification question, Mandy Jo, how should we manage the time? So I, I'm, I've got a timer on my yeah. phone. And so I, I will turn up Maybe the volume. Maybe can share it like when it's. Yeah, if, if people want to see it, I guess I could it try like and show minute. it. Yeah. Would it be um, helpful to, yeah, would it be helpful to you all if we show the timer so you have a sense or? I think it'd be easier for me to see Mandy Jo's hand if she raised her hand. That's, that would I'll be. I'll try to question. raise my hand at 30 seconds and 15 seconds. That's yeah, we want to make this, yeah. Helpful. Okay, great. Just want every. We want to feel comfortable with just having a conversation. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and uh, next up is David. My experience is based on being in leadership positions on various boards and organizations. I was the president of a condo association for 18 years. We dealt with conflicting views, usually involving finances. And I had to find a way to resolve necessary decisions. I was also the president of a synagogue in suburban Philadelphia for three years. 
That is an organization where there is rarely a lack of conflicting opinions or controversy. I have also been on the board of a local nonprofit for nine years in which I served as finance chair for four years. So I have a lot of experience dealing with boards and groups and resolving problems. Thank you. Since you have some time, did you want to elaborate on any one of the experiences? No. What? I can. I'm trying to be succinct. What would you? Is there something? Is there something you'd like to okay. know? All right. Thank you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay we can have that in the follow up. I didn't mean it as a follow up. I was just like. Okay. okay. All right. So should I? Thank you, David. Um, Jordan, we have one more. Oh, Jordan, right? Yes, yes. Um. So my experience is much smaller scale. Um, the main experience that I've thought of in terms of collaborating with a group is working on the um, operating crew at a museum during a major event. Um, and that involved a fair amount of trying to organize people, figure out who should be on which task and um, making sure that everything got done safely and in a organized manner and that's it thank you thank you thank you jordan jennifer okay um and uh i actually have the same order um of respondents so it will be vincent then david then jordan and my question is um, do you, um, how do you understand the, do you understand the role of the ZBA and how does it differ from the planning board? And uh, Vincent, you're first again. Well, I think historically, um, the, the, I mean, very interesting historically, the zoning board rules um, prohibited members of the zoning board who were town meeting members from participating in the debate or voting on article, planning board articles on the grounds that they would have to interpret the bylaw and should not be in part of the process. In other words, to go from, to both participate in the, um, in the legislative process that creates the bylaw and then turn around and participate in a quasi judicial function as as members of a zoning board who interprets the 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 zoning bylaw that that prohibition i think was lifted a while ago but i thought it was it was an interesting way to think about the process of why those functions and, and why the constitution of the commonwealth under article 30 of part one uh, takes great uh, care to talk about how those functions should be separate. The, the planning board now um, has had a lot of zoning, prior zoning board activities transferred to it under site plan review. And, but they, but they also initiate the process of creating new bylaws or amending the bylaws. And in fact, interpreting them um, for the purpose of site plan review and other activities. So, um, so to the extent that um, the planning board is sort of intimately involved in the legislative process that creates the zoning bylaw, whereas unless probably there are month, there are semi-annual or annual meetings where the zoning board members, both alternates and um, regular members meet and say, okay, are there things about this bylaw which we should tell the planning board about and maybe invite them to adjust them that we've found to be difficult. But other than that, um, my, it's really, we perform a quasi judicial function. The planning board initiates the, you know, the process and participates in the process of the legislation that creates the bylaw. And they also interpret the bylaw under certain circumstances. 
Thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, and uh, we'll ask uh, David to respond next. Well, um, my understanding is that they have very different roles and that since we're discussing the ZBA, the ZBA doesn't get involved in planning and proposing plans and projects. The ZBA is charged with being informed about and enforcing existing rules and considering proposed exceptions and can decide at that point whether it wants to grant those exceptions. But its, its role in my understanding is that it is there to enforce existing rules unless there is a compelling reason to grant an exception. Thank you. Thank you. And Jordan. My interpretation was more was along the lines of that the role of the planning board is to create the rules and then the zoning board of appeals, I mean appeals, it's in the name, is to figure out where those rules and how they should be applied when conflicts are brought before the town. Thank you. I believe we're moving on to Pat. Yes, and uh, conflating our zoning bylaws with the Constitution, I will ask my question. Um, what, inter what interpreting a provision, when interpreting, I'm sorry, a provision of the zoning bylaw, should the ZBA consider the original intent of that provision, its common sense meaning, or something else? And we're going to start with David. Um. Well, to me, a zoning bylaw is a law. It should be enforced as having been passed after appropriate consideration and a democratic process, unless there is a compelling reason to make an exception. And those reasons need to be clear and appropriate and presented properly and fit within the laws that have already been passed. So it's really a law enforcement operation as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, David. Um, Vince? Um, so my view of, I'm not an originalist, um, and, um, and, and, Thank God. <laughs> and um, with respect to gun control, neither was Justice Scalia, um, uh, who ignored the first half of the Second Amendment. Um, my, my view of our, our role in this is there, there are two aspects to it. We have to understand that the bylaw was written in parts over time. And for example, um, most of the bylaw was written before there was achieved a societal recognition that global warming is a, is an, is a real threat um, to the entire world. And it, even if the bylaw lacks specific reference to that, we have to interpret its provisions in the light of that, that understanding. So, um, yeah, the, yes, the Constitution did not um, mention abortion, but the Fourth Amendment is, uh, is still an important way to look at that right. And the same thing is true of the bylaw. Um, when the bylaw says that um, a building has to provide all the necessary services and functions uh, under site plan review. My view of that is that that doesn't mean that the building has to do it only on day one, but after day one, the bylaw, we, the bylaw has done its job. Uh, my view is that you have to ask how long this building intended to be in use 
And therefore, looking that many years ahead, um, what functions will the bylaw have to, re should the bylaw um, ensure are provided in that building so that the building functions properly for the entire proposed life of the building. And in, in that way, you, you have to sometimes, we cannot put in words in any law all of the possibilities that might, um, that might be by the law or the bylaw in this case might need to be applied to. So we have to look at the words and try to understand what those words mean in the context of the time at which we are looking at a particular proposal and deciding whether it fits within the boundaries of the bylaw or not, or how it should fit within the boundaries of the bylaw. And Jordan? Um, so I believe that you obviously do need to consider the original intent of the provision because that is the law and there is a reason it was written. And if the point of the Zoning Board of Appeals is to decide whether there should be an exemption, it's important to look at the original provision and decide, does it make sense in this particular instance? Is there a good and compelling reason to make an exemption? Thank you, Jordan. OK. Um, are there any committee members that would like to ask any follow-up questions of, um, and I'm just going to pick a random person right now, David Sloviter. And I'll go through each one. Shalini. I, I kind of asked that follow-up question earlier than later, so now is probably the right time. And I was wondering, David, it sounds like you have a lot of experience that you shared with respect to the second question. Tell us about an experience you've had collaborating with a group, particularly when opinions conflicted or the decision was controversial. And I was wondering if you could tell us about a specific experience. And I think what would be helpful to the committee is just to get a sense of the process or skills that you brought or uh, in terms of a specific experience. Oh, um, well, I'm trying to think of which role that I played would be most appropriate. Uh, in in the context of the condominium association where I was president, there were there were over the course of eighteen years, there were decisions that need to needed to be made about it was a condominium hotel, so about amenities, about modernizing, about contingency funds and proper funding of contingency funds. And there are differences of opinion. And because people invest for different reasons, some people want to keep expenses as absolutely low as possible. Other people wanted to prepare better for emergency situations. And the role of a presiding officer is often less about what they think and more about how to bring varying opinions together. So my, my role was to validate what people were proposing, what they felt was important, and to find compromises. And nobody ever gets everything they want, but compromise is the only acceptable way to find a solution. So those are the kinds of things. Do we do we get rid of all of the existing televisions and buy flat screens, or do we wait two years to do that because we want to fund something else instead? So those were the kinds of decisions where I, as the presiding officer, needed to find a consensus. And mm -hmm. I've done that in that, in the synagogue, in... Um, at the Yiddish Book Center, where I was on the board and finance chair, 
So that's essentially the role that I played. Thank you. That was very helpful. Thank you. Are there anyone else that would like to ask a follow-up question of David? I raised my hand so people could see that I want to. <laughs> um, and, and this one goes to David, you've referred a lot to compelling reasons to make exceptions to the bylaw. And okay. so I was wondering if you could um, give us an idea of what you might find a compelling reason to make an exception, if you have um, an example in mind. I don't actually have an example in mind. I, I, if I was on the ZBA, I would listen to a request and I would have to decide at that time with the evidence that's presented, if this was compelling. If it's a, a compelling reason is not simply a preference or something that somebody would like to see it it means it needs to it needs to be very relevant and central to the request for a change so i don't have any examples in mind if something it, it's almost like the um, the supreme court's definition of pornography i can't describe it but i know it when i see it <laughs> so uh if there's if a compelling reason comes along, I believe I would recognize it, but I can't I can't imagine that every request that somebody says is important to them also passes the the test of whether it's compelling or not. Thank you. Any other follow up questions for David? Seeing none, we're going to move on to Jordan. Are there any follow up questions for Jordan? Shalini. It was actually the same one that I had for David um, and Jordan. If you could elaborate a little bit, you talked about, and this is the question about collaborating, especially in a situation where there were conflict or conflicting opinions. And I was curious, and you mentioned uh, about the role you played in um, it could be that one or any other situation, just in terms of like, how did you show up to that situation or what skills or what process did you bring or, you know, your thinking process when there is a, a situation involving conflicting opinions? Um, so there are always going to be conflicting opinions on pretty much any decision that that comes up um trying to listen to everybody and trying to make sure that everybody is heard is very important um that doesn't mean there's almost never going to be a way to make everybody happy but um making sure that everybody at least understands that their views have been listened to and heard at least is important. And unfortunately it does not apply to that particular group collaboration. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is similar to the one I just asked David. You also used the term compelling reasons in your response about um, interpreting provisions of the bylaw. And so I'm curious if you have examples of what a compelling reason would be or what what sort of, at, you know, David provided a description as to what, you know, in general, compelling might mean to him. What would it mean to you? Um, safety is obviously a compelling reason. If a decision would make circumstances more safe for everybody, that would be a very compelling reason. Um, decisions that... Um, Safety is the biggest one that I can think of to come up with exemptions. Um, yeah, sorry. Thank you. Any other follow-up questions for Jordan? Are there any follow-up questions for Vincent at this time?
Can I take the opportunity to? <laughs> we, we, we will, one of our last questions sure. is an opportunity to um, say anything else you'd want. Um, okay. So um, I, I think what this shows is that you gave fuller answers. So <laughs> there were no questions left, but we're gonna move on to um, Pam. And our next sure. question, there will be another set for follow-up questions after we finish this next set. Right. So this is this looks like it's the, the fifth question. And the order of response would be Jordan, David, and then Vincent. Uh, so the question is, whose interests do you think are most important in special permit or site plan review applications? The town staff, the landowner, an applicant, the parties of, in interest, the abutters? or other residents? And we'll start with Jordan. I think my answer goes basically to parties and interests. It goes to um, the people besides the uh, landowner applicant who the decision would affect. The landowner obviously has an interest, which is why they're bringing it before the board, but um, the decision needs to consider the wider aspects of um, who else would this decision affect, how would it affect them? Um, yeah. um, David. I think all parties with a legitimate vested interest in a proposal should have their views objectively considered. Abutters may be the most affected by a proposal, but no party has a right that automatically overrides all other interested parties. It would be the quality of the evidence that would carry the most weight. A weak argument is not made stronger because of the identity of the person putting it forward. So I think it is vitally important that everybody who is interested has an opportunity to weigh in, and it is the responsibility of the zoning board to determine what is relevant and what arguments carry more weight, but not based on their identity as a specific party. Thank you. Thank you. And Vince. Yeah, so there, there are two aspects to this, I think. One is relates to the text of the bylaw, which I said in my application, is really the result of, of participation by literally the thousands of people on committees, on the town staff, um, abutters, to proposals and, and people who might be affected by zoning bylaw changes, um, the, the town meeting members and so forth, who all voted to put the words in the bylaw that we have to interpret. So we owe a, we owe a lot of respect and uh, to their efforts and to the words they, they essentially, when we're talking about compromise, this bylaw is the ultimate example of compromise because nothing got in this bylaw on the say so of one person. The second, the second thing has to do with the actual parties to a particular situation. Um, and in that regard, since this is really a, a civil proceeding and that factual information is important, um, I would say that, and I would encourage all the parties to present factual information, well documented. If the plan, if the zoning board waves a, a park, uh, a a traffic study, and a, and an abutter brings in a paid for traffic study by a professional traffic engineer that says that there's going to be this, that, and the other problem then I think the zoning board has to pay attention to the, the traffic study prepared by the abutter rather than by any statement of anyone else that's not backed up by a good analysis and facts. And I think that putting everybody 
on the on a level playing field in terms of of factual in providing factual information to the zoning board is really the essential thing of trying to be fair to everybody. Um, thank you. Thank you. We are back to Shalini. Yes. Okay. So question number six, and the order is David, Jordan, and then Vincent. And the question is, what's your opinion of waivers, exceptions, dimensional special permits in the zoning bylaw? When should they be used and when should they not be used? I think they are useful tools to resolve situations that may have special circumstances. They exist to be used judiciously when the case is made that warrants a waiver or an exception. I think it is important that they are used with restraint because the existing rules are there for a reason and have been put in place after an appropriate process. So they should not be used care, care, casually, but a zoning board should not be afraid to use them when the proper case is presented. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Jordan? They should be used carefully and they should be used when there is a compelling reason to use them. Um, there sometimes are, there are often not reasons. And David put it very well, the rules were written for a reason and there should be very careful consideration about when to make an exemption from those rules. Thank you, Jordan. Um, Vincent. Yeah, so um, so I, I have actually, in terms of the existence of such things, I really have no opinion about, and, and I should not have an opinion about whether they should be in the bylaw. Um, um, I, I, again, refer to the to Article 30 of this Constitution, which, which basically says that the judicial branch shall, ex, shall not exercise the legislative or executive powers or either of them to the end that it may be a government of laws and not of men. In other words, we're not really sitting as zoning board members with views about what parts of the bylaw should be there or not be there or should be different or according to our particular views we are there and to consider each application in the light of the bylaw as it exists before us based on the facts that are presented to us um, and whether i think there should be this or that in the bylaw is is a, it was irrelevant. I'm there, if I take the oath, to interpret the bylaw fairly and honestly and so forth. I am there to interpret the bylaw as it exists uh, in light of all of the information and evidence and facts that are presented and to make as honest and decent a judgment as I can about whether a request should be granted or not. Should I? Yes, Jennifer. Yes, Jennifer. Okay. Um, so the um, the order of responses for my quest this question would be Vince and then Jordan and then David. And it's um, the question is what is your approach to incorporating public comment into decision making? And again, we'll start with Vince. Well. Um... My approach to incorporating public comment is the same approach that I would have to incorporating um, the material provided by the applicant. Um, 
the applicant may have, I, I've heard opinions uh, at zoning board and planning board hearings that um, about this, that, or the other thing, completely unsupported by factual evidence, both from abutters and from applicants. My view is that um, if an applicant says that this is how this will be done, then my, my view would be that we put this in the order, the, if, if the applicant application is approved, that we put that in the conditions. And we insist to the applicant that if, if we grant this permit, they're going to have to operate um, as they have pledged to do. And we're going to make sure that it's in, it's in the conditions. If you violate the conditions, your permit is, uh, is suspended. And so, and, and I, again, I think that all the parties who appear before the zoning board on a matter should be held to the same standard, whether it's the staff or the, the town staff or the applicant or the abutters or a bank that's providing you know, uh, funding, all have to provide, meet the same standard, give us the facts, show that the facts support your, your um, your point of view, but op just opinions without facts are not, in, in my opinion, persuasive. Um, and I would just encourage every person who appears before the zoning board um, to, to, to present facts. And I think that the zoning board will function much better. Our decisions will be much more widely accepted um, if we focus on um, holding everybody to the same standard. Um, Thank you. And uh, Jordan. Oh. I think there should be a certain level of caution with regards to how public input is received. Um, it's frankly, Reminds me of something of reviews. People will only give a review if they have a very strong opinion one way or the other. People who have less of a view are unlikely to submit public comment would be. Um, the other um, important thing I believe about public commentary is if there is a large group of people coming out either in favor or against something, the reason as to why should be carefully considered. Thank you. And uh, David. Public opinion is, wait, am I muted? Oh no, oh, no, I'm not, okay. Public input is another source to be fully considered. As a town committee, the ZBA is the representative of the citizens of Amherst and it is appropriate and necessary that public opinion is considered as another interested party. If the input is relevant and objective, it should be included in the consideration and become part of what the committee um, takes into consideration in making its decision. I think public opinion is appropriate uh, as an, just another entity in the discussion. Thank you. Moving on to Pam. Yes, uh, the order of, of responses will be David, Jordan, and then Vince. So question eight, what else? Oh, this is, this is the question. What else uh, would you like us to know? Would you like us to know about you that makes you a strong candidate for the ZBA? Anything you wanted to add that fleshes out earlier points that you made? Um, not so much. I'm, I'm experienced in many areas, including business, construction, uh, public service, other areas. I, I have a varied background. I'm accustomed to assessing varied information to make and implement decisions. So 
working on a board is not a new venue for me. It's not a new experience. I've been in numerous difficult situations where passions run high and hot. Um, I've been told I'm an idiot at the same meeting where I was told I was brilliant and they were probably both wrong. So uh, I'm, I'm just accustomed to being in this kind of situation. So I feel that the ZBA is an appropriate fit for me. Thank you. Thank you. Jordan. I did want to um, reiterate, despite the recentness from of the experience from my application, um, the fact that I'm part of the volunteer fire department in Pelham, which I don't, well, I don't have um, as much experience in that as I would like. I think it has given me a much better understanding of how fire safety is incorporated in decisions. And I think that could potentially be useful on the ZBA. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I think that um, it would be helpful for the committee to know that, and some of them have asked the, um, seen uh, me do this, that I've walked down the aisle many times back to my seat at town meeting, not having been successful in, um, uh, in, in a presentation and, and managed to listen and, and, and understand why and so forth and be able to take, go from there to um, successfully accomplish things on the second or third try. And I think that's my approach to people as well, that it is important to listen, to try to understand, and, and come to some uh, consensus um, from, from everyone's different perspective as, as you See, just with the three of us, and there are five members on the on the ZBA um, regular uh, boards. So, I think that I've also been involved a lot in inter in interpreting and providing information and evidence regarding the section of the bylaw ten point three eight, which the zoning board uses. It has to go through in a, in a really honest and fair way to evaluate each application, whether it's a really small thing or a very large project. You have to go through all, all almost twenty questions, and um, so I'm familiar with that process, um, and I'm I will be. As somebody who has spent the last 20 years of my life basically working with kids at, a, at an age where I don't think anyone expected that, that I didn't expect and no one else expected that I would do that, um, shows that I am a flexible, open person who can um, bring to a situation uh, the ability to both listen and to act. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, one last question, and then we'll see if there's any follow up questions from the committee members. Um, this one's, um, I don't think you'll need three minutes to respond to it. So um, this is basically a confirmation question, which is, to please confirm that you have the time to commit to the hearings, the site visits, and the Thursday evening 6 p.m. meetings. So we'll start with Jordan. Um, since I initially submitted my application, I've started a new job at the bottom of the uh, seniority pile, so I'm actually not sure. Thank you. Um, Vincent. Yes, I can do all those. and. Um... 
I've, I've had a very busy schedule the last few years. I've spent a lot of time driving people who don't have cars, can't get driver's licenses to work at nursing homes throughout the pandemic. I don't think I spent a single day home and <laughs> memorizing their phone numbers, um, mornings having 10 to 15 trips to get people to and from work, to and from school. And I'm, um, and my schedule is now not less, uh, less than it was and um, taught for the people how to drive who now have driver's licenses. And so I've, I'm really going to have, uh, and starting next July 1st, even more room in my schedule. So I don't think I will have any problem accommodating the uh, demands of the zoning board. Thank you. And David? I do have the time. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask the committee members if they have any follow-up questions for Jordan. I'm not seeing any hands for that one. Are there any follow-up questions for Vincent? Shalini. Yes, Vincent, you mentioned uh, factual information as being really important in several questions. Uh, I'm speaking actually specifically to the fifth one, where we talked about whose interests do you think are most important in the special permit or site plan review applications. And uh, you had mentioned um, the importance of factual information. Uh, and could you explain what factual information means to you and especially when they're when they're yeah okay let's just let's keep it at that like what is what is examples or what so, is factual I can give you a couple of instances one it was a, a neighbor who um, family needed to, to construct on land that they owned um, adjacent to their existing home uh, a home that was on one level and um, and the zoning board struggled with it. And I think I, um, it, it turned out that there was a, a factual matter regarding the, the original configuration of the land and the existing configuration of the land that allowed the zoning board to, to grant a, um, uh, a variance for the use of the, the particular lot. And so, it's that kind of fact. I mean, I'm I, a lot of times, you know, uh, trying to compromise. It's easier to compromise when when there's more factual information than there than it is when we're simply dealing with people's opinions. I've also seen situations where um, applicants, not before the planning board, not before the zoning board of appeals. Um, have claimed uh, there's a couple of claims that I that I've found particularly um, incredible, meaning not credible. Um, one applicant for a large scale housing project said that there would only be the these one bedroom apartments, which were the primary units, were going to be priced at eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month, and that only one person would occupy each bedroom in, in all of the uh, apartments in the proposal. And this is a college town. I've lived here for 50 years. I came here as a student. I found that um, without any credibility whatsoever, and I found it distressing that the planning board did not insist either on a condition to that effect or you know, some credible proof that such a thing would would be likely, um, and the second um, the second situation was um, a a statement actually of the um, member of the planning department staff um, on a project either that project or a similar one to the effect that the people who would occupy a, this particular structure. Which was in the center, which is in the center of town, would not have automobiles. When in fact, of course, 
subsequent to the construction of that pro and and no one believed that either because if you can afford to pay eighteen hundred to two thousand dollars for an apartment, you're probably going to have a car here and a car someplace wherever you came from. Um, and um, is that kind of in in one case providing factual information and in the second case the permitting authority um, allowing statements bald statements of fact which were unsupported by any factual information whatsoever um, to to be to to be the basis of a decision I think please wrap up is important uh, it's important to to focus on that kind of thing. That's why I talked about those factual matters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other follow-up questions for Vincent? <clears throat> Seeing none, are there any follow-up questions for David? Seeing none, I want to thank um, Vincent, David, and Jordan. Oh, Pat, you... Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I have a quick question for oh. David. Okay. Is that all right? Yes. Um, in your response to um, um, whose interests, you said something that interests you. You said all parties with legitimate views, and then you referred to the quality of the evidence. But you're, uh, and I'm wondering what criteria do you have for a legitimate view? How do you how do you sort those things? Well, every view is legitimate to the person who is advancing the opinion. The members of the ZBA have to decide. We we would have to make uh, exercise our judgment as to whether something is legitimate. Uh, and more more relevant than than even legitimate, but there are certain views that make no sense, even though a person may deeply believe it. And if they propose something, and we are charged with determining if that is legitimate or or relevant, I mean the word itself is. I'm not using the word legitimate as a way of invalidating somebody's right to propose something. If somebody advances something that makes no sense, doesn't pass the smell test, it's the responsibility of the ZBA to basically say that doesn't make any sense. There are also views that are just objectionable. And, you know, if somebody says, I don't want to, I don't want uh, a certain project because uh, immigrants may come to it. That's not legitimate to me. So there are arguments that people believe that they advance sincerely that don't make any sense. And the ZBA is charged with determining if something is compelling, factual, and makes sense. And that's that's what I mean by legitimate. Does it actually warrant objective consideration? Thank you, David. Thank you. I've seen no other hands. I want to thank Jordan, Vincent, and David for their time today, um, for coming out, for completing the statements of interest, for completing the community activity forms, for your interest in the ZBA and serving on town boards and committees. You know, we can't um, operate this town without the volunteer time of its residents. Um, and I know we on the council in going through this process in order to get to even being considered for appointment, ask a lot of time of our candidates um, just to get to this process. So we really appreciate that you took all of the time to jump through all those hoops basically and come here today and answer all of our questions. Um, and so um, before I basically ask Athena to remove you from the panelist section and into the audience, you're allowed to stay for the deliberations in the audience, um, or you can leave um, completely. You don't have to watch us deliberate about you if you don't want, um, but I will 
um, notify uh, myself or Pam will figure out who afterwards will one of us will notify you later today as to what the vote of this committee is in terms of a recommendation to the council. This committee does not have the authority to actually appoint you. Come on. Um, appoint you to any board uh, to the ZBA. That is the purview of the council. All we do is make recommendations. The next council meeting is January 9th. And so any recommendation we make today will not be acted on by the council until January 9th. I do expect it to be acted on on January 9th. Um, so, but we will let you know what our recommendation is before that so that you know what's what's going on and what's going to appear on the agenda on the ninth. Before I ask Athena to move, do either any of the three of you have any questions about the continuing process or anything before we move on to deliberations? I, I just want to thank the council for their time. Thank you. <laughs> Um, with that, then I'm going to ask Athena to move our three candidates and applicants into the audience. They're welcome to stay in the audience or they can hit the leave button themselves if they want and and move on with their day instead of watching us if they'd like. Um, I'd like to say thank you. Also. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate yeah. stepping up. Thank you so much for the opportunity. You're welcome. Thank Thanks. you. We'll wait until, okay, we are all moved, if I've got my screen correct. Um, yes, so um, at this time, we're going to take this slightly differently than we tend to take this. It, normally, we have more candidates than spaces, and so so we might be discussing, a, it, in some sense, one over another so we discuss all of them and then we let our views known um we have three openings that we can appoint to and so instead of taking that two set process i thought we'd just go through each candidate themselves um and and sort of we'll vote a slate is is my intention but we can go through each candidate themselves talk about their qualifications our thoughts and then thoughts on whether we would want them to be part of a motion to recommend the council appoint or not. Um, and then we'll move on to the next candidate and the candidate after that. And then in the end, once we've got thoughts on all of them, we'll we'll do one motion was my thoughts. If people would like a different process before we start that process, let, let's decide on how we're going to do it. But that's what I thought we could do since there are three openings potentially and three candidates. Um, so with that, I'm just going to take the candidates in alphabetical order because it's the easiest way to do it in my mind. Um, so we're going to start with Jordan Helzer and thoughts on qualifications and then on whether to recommend appointment to an associate member position. Pam. I enjoyed hearing from Jordan. Um, of the three, of the three uh, candidates, Jordan has the least amount of experience in obviously boards and committees and, and town process, but I think he brings a wonderful perspective on living in the town. What are, what are some of the elements that we as townspeople deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and how, and how projects or how um, changes in town may um, be enhanced um, or affected by uh, a, a project coming to the ZBA. And I think um, I, I like the idea that someone wants to step forward and participate in the community. It's, um, in my mind, it's a way to sort of engage somebody and, and, and make it a, a pathway for further engagement as time goes on. So I'm very, I'm very pleased um, just from that perspective to, to see Jordan step up and, and, um, and be part of this, uh, in terms of more specifics on, um, sort of approach to things, I, I appreciated that, um, I think there's, there's good, good consideration of process, understanding that, um, the bylaw is the bylaw, uh, and we can't we can't interpret everything. So we are, um, you know, 
ZBA has asked for looking for good and compelling reasons were his words for for looking for an asking for an exemption, for instance. So I'm I'm pleased to keep him on the list. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. Shalini. Yeah, I think everything that Pam said, I just feel he brings a very different perspective in terms of age, like in terms of diversity, where, you know, being able to um, attract younger people and, um, and just the different perspective that he brings, I'm repeating myself. So yeah, I, I definitely support him. And I thought his process also, even though he doesn't have the experience, um, he see, what I appreciated was the fact that he, you know, is willing to listen to the different perspectives. And he kind of said that through multiple things about, um, you know, who is this going to affect and how would it affect them? And then make decisions based on that. Um, he did talk about his time um, commitment changing, but my take, I'm not, I don't know what the process is for that, Mandy Jo, but my take on that is, you know, most people or many people are busy and have work. And so how can we work with them? And, you know, and, and there might be some give and take over there, but I think we want to make our committees accessible to working people. So let's find a way to make that work if, you know, if you go that direction. Thank you, Shalini. Jennifer. Um, yeah, I just wanted to come in. In terms of the schedule, though, I think we know the meetings are at six on Thursdays. So I would, you know, just confer with him if he, you know, knows that he can't make six o'clock, then that's not going to work. So I, I think the scheduling there is just to confirm that, you know, he may not be able to make every Thursday at six, but if you can't make any Thursday at six, that's not going to work. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Pat. Yeah, just a quick response uh, to what you said, Jennifer, because all of the meetings are recorded. Uh, and if there was a commitment on a applicant's part to watch those meetings, even if they weren't able to attend on the evening that it's, it's happening, um, that that lessens your concern for me. I, I had a similar concern, but it lessens me when I remember the meetings are uh, taped. Uh, and if you had to deliberate, if you had to be present. Well, no, if he were deliberating as an associate member, he would know that in advance and he would already make a commitment to be at the meeting. Right, but he just, just to confirm that his schedule is such that he could make those. Right. Yeah, and, and what I'm saying is he has a lot to learn. Um, but And one of the things that he could do would be to watch regular meetings that he can attend for whatever reason of the of the planning board and the zone, you know, so that he gets a real sense of what the workings are. So there are ways for him to still stay connected and involved, I think. Yeah, um, and I took his, I, I actually appreciated the honesty about the time commitment, you know, <laughs> I, I really did um, for someone who sat through the interviews and I took the response as more of a not sure, not for the meeting attendance, but more of the time outside of the meetings to learn and to attend maybe site visits and, and things like that, that might not happen during the meeting times. Um, but at this, at, at that point, you know, I think if we're looking for working people, <laughs> working adults to be able to volunteer, we have to take that into consideration. And I almost think an associate membership is a, is a, in some sense, a good spot to start when you're not quite sure of how much time you have because you're not on every application. You're not on every hearing. You're, you're, you might only get one or two in the next six months or one or something where you might more easily be able to fit it into your schedule. And so I'd be much more concerned if we were looking at appointments as full members that are expected to be there twice a month, every month, and all of that at all the hearings as much as possible, than an associate member, especially as we 
potentially ramp up our associate memberships to a more full set of associate members where you know we've heard that the current one is being relied on heavily but if we have more that commitment hopefully will decrease so i agree but we asked the question because we yeah. want to know yes, that no and, and so i actually appreciate the honesty yeah. right um, um on that any other comments on Jordan at this time or thoughts before we move on to our next applicant? See none. Uh, Vincent is the next person in alphabetical order. So thoughts on Vincent's uh, responses application and on potential recommendations to the council. Um, Mandy, I, Mandy, you have your hand up. Yes, I thought I'd start, um, or at least normally I sit here quiet. Um, Vin, Vincent, you know, I I don't I, I've seen Vincent in action at town meetings and all. Um, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a personal relationship with him at all, but uh, I thought his answers to basically every question were thoughtful, comprehensive, um, you know, and and showed a level of detail um, and knowledge that that is something that could um you know and, and detail knowledge and even just um perspective i would say that that you know uh would be good on on a um on a board or committee just in the approach to um you know how how he responded to the questions and how he would approach these questions and and the hearings and everything and so you know in that sense uh, all i i basically only have positive things to say so pam yes i would i would echo that um i was um was impressed by the level of knowledge understanding the sort of the, the composition and creation of bylaws and the fact that they are done over time um uh you know <laughs> the examples of you know global warming isn't explicitly spelled out in the constitution you know all these things are are sometimes implied for essentially reason of protecting of the, the health and safety of a town that's what that's what zoning is all about and so his understanding of uh the role of of the a zoning bylaw and then this interpretation by the by the zba for enactment of projects um so just again uh impressed with the knowledge of of the process and and also um the stated intent to have a a fair and open hearing of of all the facts and i think that's that's exactly what we ask the ZBA to do is to have a fair and open um, ex exploration of all the facts in making any decisions. So I'm I'm very happy to put him forward. And I saw Jennifer, you unraised your hand. It makes me think that maybe <laughs> Pam covered what you were going to say, but I'll give yes. you the opportunity yes. again. <laughs> Anything else about Vincent? We will move on to David. Comments, thoughts on David's application, responses, and then potential recommendations to the committee, to the council, not the committee, the council. Shalini. Yeah, I really appreciated his thoughtful uh, responses. Like once he did expand on the specific experience in the conflicting and about you know really listening and willingness to compromise uh i appreciated that and just his vast experience um in across the board um yeah so thank you shalini jennifer yes i agree i think david was a very strong candidate i think he's had a lot of experiences and i think he um really comes to this position with a very open mind so i, I think he's an excellent candidate and pam thanks um yeah i i think he's a 
terrific candidate. Um, and in his statement of interest, it was also the fact that he has worked in development, he's worked in, in construction. And those are the kinds of um, experiences that, you know, help understand the sort of the practicalities of a project when it's being presented to the ZBA is you kind of have to, it, it's very helpful if you can visualize, you know, what that means to add on a building or to, to grade a slope um, that, you know, those are those are the the physical ramifications of a project, and I think it's it's very helpful that he that he brings that as well as just you know a very rich background of of working with a lot of people on boards to to come to decision. And I don't know that compromise is necessarily the word that you know if he if he were asked you know is that is that your golden rule is to compromise? I don't think that's what he meant. I think it was that he um, he's gives due consideration to all of the elements and looks to as i as i think vince o'connor does looks to knit where people can work together and i think that's just very important especially on um, small boards that you need to you need to come up with a fair and and equitable uh solution so i would definitely definitely recommend them jennifer yeah and i do think these candidates um bring a geographic diversity, which the ZBA chair said was needed. One's from North Amherst, one's from sort of in town, and I believe uh, Jordan is from a, a different part. So I think that that's a good mix. So I can speak to that before, um, I'll, I'll say I've heard a motion, uh, well, I've heard what the motion might be is to recommend all three, but before I make that motion, I'll speak to the, the demographics. Um, because I did that this morning. So in terms of um, it, in terms of residents, because Jennifer brought that up, um, all the all the percentages will be in the report. But um, one of them lives in District One, one of them lives in District Two, and one of them lives in District Four. Um, the one thing I did find out um, the current members, which we have six, um, if you if you combine the five full and the one associate. Um, five of them live in district four and one lives in district two. Um, so we are very district four heavy. Is that <laughs> the new district four? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, these are on the, in the new districts. We have five of our six current members live in district four and one lives in district two. Um, the other thing that struck me in terms of age is that, that this, this sets of um, candidates will actually, depending on how you look at age distribution, will bring some diversity. Right now, 50% of the six members are 60 to 69. Um, and there's one member 18 to 29, one 30 to 39, and one 70 to 79. And so our candidates are in the age range of 18 to 29, 70 to 79, and 80 plus. And so we'll still skew, have, skew towards the older end of the range, but um, with 50% in the 60 to 69, we're adding the sum above and some below um, that sort of median that's in there, which I thought was also interesting. Um, Jennifer. And we do have, I don't know if you looked at this, but a mix of renters and homeowners, which is also good. So that I'm not sure is on the CAFs, so that I can't necessarily we don't we don't track that we on don't the, track that but i think that's maybe true but yes the, the current board has at least one renter um and and i believe the the candidates have a num are are right. more renters than owners i actually think on on our of the three current applicants i think are two renters one owner um so yeah so again you know I'd, in certain areas, as we always say, the demographics and the diversity are not necessarily present. Um, but in other areas, the the diversity it it will actually increase the diversity of of the body, um, and and those numbers will be in the report that gets written as we've done in the past. So with that, um, given what I've heard, I'm going to make a motion to to recommend the, count, the town council 
appoint Jordan Helzer, Vincent O'Connor, and David Sloviter as associate members to the Zoning Board of Appeals, effective immediately for a term to end June 30, 2023. Second, Shalini. Shalini is going to second that. And then uh, if you wouldn't mind just repeating that motion so I make sure to get the language down um, just right, that would be much appreciated. Thank you so I, much. I will do that, Kelly. I, I will read it again slowly. I, I was trying to read slowly, but you, you're not used to these motions, so I will read it again. It's to recommend the town council appoint Jordan Helzer, Vincent O'Connor, and David Sloviter as associate members to the Zoning Board of Appeals, effective immediately for a term to end June 30, 2023. And I, Mandy, made the motion and Shalini seconded that motion. Is there any discussion on the motion? See no discussion, we will start with a vote um, and we're gonna go in reverse order just for the fun of it. So we're starting with Jennifer. Uh, yes. And Pam. <laughs> yes. Mandy is an I, Pat. I. And Shalini. Yes. And so that is a unanimous vote. Um, Pam, do you wanna let the three applicants know about that vote or would you like me to? Certainly. I, I will be happy to do it. I'm actually not leaving town for another hour, so. <laughs> okay. And Jennifer, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just have to say this. I'm not trying to be um, divisive or to bring up any sore points, but I still, um, I'm very pleased that we, and I support and affirm that we fill the three positions, but I do think John Varner was also a missed opportunity. I think he was as qualified as those that we affirmed. I just wanted to say that for myself, for the record. Thank you. And perhaps he should have shown up and been available. Well, we don't have to, I don't want to discuss that. Uh, let's not get into okay. that too much, but thank you for your comments, Jennifer and Pat. Athena. So I was just going to ask that Pam, if when you let them know that they've been recommended, that you specify that it's pending a council vote to mm -hmm. uh, appoint them, and the earliest possible date would be January nine. I'm not sure right now how full that agenda is. Um, I think we're scheduled to take a look at it this Wednesday. So, if you'd like, I can follow up with you and let you know. Um, if we're expecting to put those appointments on the agenda for the 9th, and if not, it would be January 23rd. Thank you, Athena. And I will contact Lynn and Anna about that agenda um, and information from CRC, because I believe CRC would like it acted on as soon as we can. But I will let Lynn and Anna know about that and know about the votes and everything related to that. Shalini and then Kelly. Yeah, may I leave because I'm super yes. late for dinner. Okay, yes. Thank you. <laughs> and Bye -bye. Kelly, happy holiday. <laughs> and my you. last question was just if you could repeat the uh, term one more time. The oh. term was the only thing I was missing. Effective immediately um, for a term to end June 30, 2023. Thank you so much. I've got it. You're welcome, Kelly. Are there any announcements? I don't have anything unanticipated, which means we are adjourned at 1129 AM. Thank you all for the extra meeting. Thanks. Thank Happy you holidays. for getting the, uh, the schedule. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah.